The keel for Nautilus was laid at General Dynamics Electric Boat Division at Groton, Connecticut on 14 June 1952 by President Truman. She was christened by Mrs. Eisenhower on 21 January 1954. Yeah, those old-time radios. You gotta love them. Just too bad they're useless now because you can't play your MP3s on them. Or can you? Well, actually the recording that you just heard was an MP3 played on this cell phone, but amplified and made audible by this 1954 tube radio. In this video I'm going to show you that you can basically attach even the latest smartphones, tablets, laptops, PCs and other gadgets to basically any radio or stereo, no matter how old or what brand they are. In some cases you just need an adapter, in others a slight modification of that radio might be necessary. For that I will just give you some examples and then I will explain to you why these devices from different eras are actually compatible. This 1954 Nordman de Rigoletto tube radio can actually very easily be connected to modern sound sources via two 4mm input jacks at its backside. The two jacks were originally used to connect an old-fashioned turntable with a crystal pickup to the radio. But it can be used as a high-level input for even the latest gadgets as well. To connect modern sound sources, I built this adapter from RCA stereo to 4mm banana plugs mono. I will explain the technical details of why this is even possible later in this video. This 1975 Grundig C6200 radio cassette combination has an input jack at its backside as well. It was originally thought for external tape recorders, but can also serve as an input for modern sound sources. What you will need though is this adapter from Dean to RCA. The same is true for many old amplifiers and radios, like this 1975 Tonberg receiver. With these kind of devices, the auxiliary as well as the tape inputs can be used as general high level inputs. The phono jack is not suited for mp3 players and the like as I will explain later. But what about these typical 1990s radios that can be found in virtually any household? In most cases they have no auxiliary input jacks at all. But you can simply modify them and add an input jack so that you can play your mp3s on them. I have done exactly that to these two radios and I will show you how that is done in this video. Actually you can add such a general purpose input jack to any device that has an audio amplifier built in it. But for you to understand how this can be done I will now first explain the basic operation of all these different devices. I will also have to say one or two words about general misconceptions about the evolution of electronics in the last decades. See, one thing that I hear all the time is that we live in the digital age, therefore everything is digital now. Furthermore, many people seem to believe that so-called smart devices are fundamentally different from older technology. In some aspects that might be true, in others however that assumption is wrong. To show you what I mean, let us talk about the way that audio signals go before they reach your ear. Let's say we have some kind of sound source. That might be your latest smartphone or tablet, but it could also be an audio cassette deck, a CD player, a microphone or an old fashioned tape recorder. Although I call them sound sources, they do not produce sound, but electrical signals. To be more precise, all these devices can be seen as AC voltage sources that provide alternating voltages of varying amplitude and frequencies under 20 kHz. The voltages that can be measured at their audio outputs can be described as superimposed sinusoidal functions. These output voltages are analog in nature, because they are not restricted to discrete values. Yes, you heard right, even the latest smartphone has an analog audio output. Many people will say now, I know that my phone is a digital device and it plays mp3 files which are of course digital in nature. That's right, but think again. If you have a PC, you sure know that it needs some kind of sound card to be able to produce audio output. Well, basically sound cards are nothing but digital to analog converters, abbreviated DAGs, which convert the digital input coming from the computer to analog audio signals that can then be amplified. Such DAGs are not only to be found in your PC, but also in your phone and any other device that can be attached to earphones of some kind. 
but because the output power of all these sources is too weak to directly drive a loudspeaker, an audio amplifier is needed. That amplifier also requires an external source of energy to deliver an output power higher than that of the source. The amplifier can then drive a loudspeaker or some earphones, which then of course will emit sound waves which will finally reach your ear. The amplifier, earphones, loudspeakers, sound waves and of course your ear work on analog effects. The methods used for the amplification of analog electronic signals and their conversion to sound waves are basically the same they were in the 1960s, other than the miniaturization and integration of the electronic components, not much has changed since then. Even class D amplifiers, which are sometimes called digital amplifiers because they use pulse width modulation, do deliver an analog output signal and are in most cases built to also receive analog input signals. Therefore, despite all the change that we have seen in digital electronics since the 1980s, modern computers and phones can still work in conjunction with old school analog audio equipment and will most likely do so in the future. Now that it should be clear why even two unlikely partners like a 1950s radio and a modern cell phone can work together, I will try to clarify the following points. How are radios and similar audio devices built up internally? Why do they have different inputs of which some are suited for modern sound sources while others don't? And finally, how can you tap into an old radio that has no input jacks at all? The amplifier sections of old radios, cassette decks and tape recorders which can work as a standalone device, meaning that they have an internal loudspeaker, almost always work in the same way. The inputs for low impedance, low voltage sources like microphones and magnetic cartridges for phonographs are connected via a selector switch to the input of the preamplifier. That first amplifier stage amplifies the low input voltages which range from fractions of millivolts to a couple of millivolts to a level of around 1 volts. At the output of the preamp another source selector switch can often be found. Here sources with relatively high impedances and voltages of around 1 volts can be attached. The output of the preamp is often connected to some kind of equalizer. The equalizer is a network of adjustable RC filters that can be used to weaken or strengthen certain frequency bands of the input signal. It can be recognized by the potentiometers involved which are often labeled bass, treble or tone. The output signal of the equalizer is then going into the potentiometer which is used for volume control. Its output goes then to the driver and power amplifier sections which finally power the loudspeaker. In the typical 1990s radios we saw before you often have no input jacks. Sometimes you have a microphone input jack, but that is only suitable for very low voltage sources and it is only active when the cassette deck is in recording mode. You sure don't want to use that for your modern gadgets. If you want to add an input jack for modern high level input devices like mp3 players or smartphones, you would have to tap the circuit here, where the radio receiver signal is fed into the amplifier. In my experience the best way to do this is the following. You find out where the signal from the receiver is fed into the amplifier circuit. You solder some wires directly to that point and attach it to your new jack which you place somewhere in the case of the radio. To prevent that your external source and the radio are active at the same time, you can add an additional switch to the radio with which you can turn off the radio while the amplifier circuit stays on. It would be even better to attach a real source selector switch to the amplifier input, but it works without one as well. Here you can see one of the 1990s radios. I already removed the two loudspeakers in the cassette deck. They are, in most cases, attached via little plugs to the PCB and can very easily be removed and put back on again. Here we have all the different functional groups of the radio. You can see the preamp. Under it, the power supply. On the left, you see the power amp, which can be recognized by the aluminum sheet, which acts as a heatsink. Over it you see the volume control and equalizer potentiometers. And finally on the right hand side on a separate board you find the radio receiver. This particular model is very easy to work with. 
because amplifier and receiver are physically separated. Since only five wires connect the two PCBs, it is very easy to find the two contacts to which the new high-level input jacks must be connected. One of the wires must be the supply voltage. Another one is chassis ground and two of the remaining three must be the left and the right channel of the radio receiver. After some tracing and measuring, I was sure about the pinouts of those wires, so what I did was to cut the wires, put them together again and attach some new wire for the external input jack. I used some duct tape as insulation, since no insulating tape was left. Then I drilled a fitting hole for the jack where there was free space. Then I put in the jack and glued it with super glue. Normally you can screw them in, but that didn't work with this thick plastic case. When the glue was finally dried, I soldered the connecting wires to the jack. With that being done, I looked for a good place for the new off-on switch for the radio receiver. For that, I drilled several holes, put the switch in and soldered the wire with the supply voltage on it. The switch, by the way, was salvaged from an ATX power supply. With all that done, I put the radio back together and voila, it worked. This procedure is of course a bit different with each model. But I hope you got some ideas from this video and maybe you want to give one of those oldies a new purpose too. So if you like this video, please watch my other videos and please subscribe to my channel.